Hello everyone, I'm Ismail Pai Sivico and welcome to the Youth On Air podcast. So today we have on board, we have BC, which we've been working with on some, hello BC, we've been working with you for quite a lot of projects actually Anna, and we thought it was awesome to have you on board and speak about this specific topic because, uh, which is hate crime of course, we're going to get a bit more into, uh, into details a bit later, hate crime against the LGBTQI plus community, which is something you have been working on quite a bit. And following especially the recent events in Belgium, we thought it was very a contemporary matter to, to actually speak about and very important in not just in Belgium, but in Europe, in Europe in general. Uh, so let's start with you, because of course this podcast is about you, this episode is about you. So what, what, what can you tell us about you? Who are you? Where do you work? Where are you from? Uh, a bit in a nutshell, who is busy? <laughs> Great question. So thanks, first of all, for having me. I'm a Really happy to be able to talk about this topic and I hope it will be interesting and informative for everybody. So my name is Bisi, I'm 23 years old. I live in Brussels. Um, I'm from Germany and from Benin uh, and I identify as uh, a black queer lesbian. So I am part of the LGBTQI community and um, I am also a racialized person. Um, I used to work for the Rainbow House Brussels, which is uh, the umbrella organization in Brussels, which kind of um, assembles many different LGBTQI organizations. Uh, now I don't uh, work for them anymore, but we still collaborate on some projects. Um, amongst them, the Brave New Year project, with the, which is a project, uh, a youth project where we um, work on hate speech. So not really hate crime, but we will see that both are linked. Um, and yeah, that's what I do and who I am in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get about hate speech a little bit later because because there are some links and I think it's interesting to, to let's say dive a bit into both topics, which they're not exactly the mm -hmm. same thing, but you can find some links between the both uh, and we can speak about that. I do have a question. So for how long have you been in Belgium, more or less? Uh, so I've been in Belgium, I think this is my first year. First, I used to live for three years in uh, Louvain-la-Neuve, so more in the French speaking part in the, the university city. And it has been three years that I'm living in Brussels in different neighborhoods. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be very interesting too, because we've got, I'm, I'm going to ask you a bit if have you seen any differences, specifically now, have you seen any differences mm -hmm. between being, let's say, a, a queer lesbian in Belgium and in Germany, for example, or does that stay pretty much uh, the same in those two contexts? Um, so the thing is that I haven't really um, lived for a long time in Germany since... Uh, I started to live my identity as a queer person. So I grew up in Germany and then I traveled. I lived for a few years <clears throat> in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and then I came to Belgium. And let's say when I started really exploring my identity and living my identity, I, I was already in Belgium. Um, I would say it's similar in Germany to Belgium. Uh, I think the biggest difference is really if you're in a rural area or in a bigger city. So I am from a rural area. And uh, of course, like there's a huge difference between my hometown village in Germany and uh, the capital of Brussels. Yeah, I think I do agree with that. With that premise is that indeed in in cities generally you have so many different people in the end that it's mm -hmm. a lot easier to integrate within the society. But when you get into more smaller rural areas, uh, there's more like a homogeneity in in the people in themselves so it's a bit more difficult you can stand out a little bit more so integration does become a little bit harder um, in that context when it comes to LGBTQI plus community in Belgium uh, we can cover the um, let's say different sexualities or different gender expressions if you want but how can how can you live your life in Belgium generally is it okay like to hug to kiss to walk in the street uh, or are there some, let's say, some moments where you do feel uncomfortable in just living your sexuality in, in this country? Um, I think it's uh, quite a difficult answer. It's neither black nor white. So on the one hand, you have this legal situation, which is great in Belgium. Belgium was one of the first countries to legalize same-sex marriage. Adoption is also uh, authorized here. So uh, from a legal point of view, there are... Yeah, the laws are very gay friendly um, and there is absolutely no uh, problem, let's say. But the reality um, isn't following up this legal framework. So uh, unfortunately, uh, no, you can't hug, kiss uh, and just display your homosexuality or your trans identity or a different gender expression in public. Um, 
sometimes you feel maybe very comfortable and um, at your ease uh, and confident enough to do it. But uh, for sure, you will be confronted to um, too many looks, many weird looks, comments, uh, unasked comments, um, be it uh, sexualized comments or like homophobic comments. And uh, then you also risk, in the worst case, a physical aggression. Um, I think everybody, everything really depends on uh, with whom you are, in what uh, kind of um, mental state you are, um, at what time you're going outside, are there people around you or not. So there are different factors, but uh, it's definitely uh, not so easy to, to be queer in the public uh, space. Yeah, and, and did you see a, a, I mean, I get all of that, especially because I mean, I've lived in Brussels also for, for 10 years and I have, and I've been out with a lot of friends that are either gay, um, mm-hmm. even, even more feminine, uh, heterosexual men also that, that, that get the same kind of, of looks or of comments or in bars maybe. Uh, but I did get the impression though, that there are, it really depends in the part of Brussels. And I think, I'm not entirely sure what to take out of that. I'm not entirely sure what to take uh, out of the fact, is it Brussels in general, or is it, let's say, the, the education of different groups of people within Brussels? And that's really what me gets me a bit into a, into a dilemma, because I'm not really sure how to interpret that. Um, so do you think, because we, and we agreed on the fact that, um, to, on a legal point of view, to, to some extent, there are quite a lot of liberties in Belgium. That's exactly why when we spoke about, well, we we're going to do previously about queer refugees, that Belgium is one of their first stops, because here they do get, let's say, a lot easier access than in other European countries. Uh, so on the legal sphere, it is kind of okay, but there's still a big issue in terms of education of the general population. And I think you're right with that, that the both didn't follow up like you have the legal system that really started to get quite progressive in, 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 in its time and then afterwards you got the education that is a bit tailing <laughs> tailing behind so h- how do you wedge that gap how do you see the education following up or is it the culture or is it a bit like the the religion in belgium uh if 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 you have a such thing as a religion in belgium if you will um what's your take on that um, so I think uh, that's a great, a, a good question and also a very uh, delicate question because, of course, when we talk about homo and transphobia, um, many people and political parties are very quick to uh, try to uh, point uh, on fingers certain part of the population, especially, uh, um, yeah, doing Islamophobic comments and basically they are trying to appropriate um, an LGBTQI plus discourse. So, okay, let's say we are pro-gay, we are open, and these people come to our countries, open as we are, and they are the problem and the root of homophobia in Belgium, which is totally, totally false. So homophobia, which is also deriving from sexism, is as much widespread in these communities as it is in, uh, let's say, the classical Belgian um, white Christian communities. Um, there is not more or, or less. It's really, you cannot stage something like this generally. And also um, the kind of um, statistics that sometimes uh, politicians want to make to kind of uh, know which neighborhoods are more dangerous. Um, most of the time, these statistics at the end of the day, they don't even, they aren't even useful for the victims, be it sexism or homophobia. Because, okay, maybe we will have some numbers. Let's say, okay, there there are more people, there are more homophobic crimes. What the government do, they will send more police officers. They will um, try to criminalize uh, the, the, the people around there. But at the end of the day, the root of the problem of homo and transphobia is not at all um, taken, into, taken into account. So I'm really careful when I talk about uh, homophobia and transphobia, uh, because I do not want to add more to the stigmatization and discrimination of uh, racialized populations. And also because being uh, a black queer person, I know all the cliches and stigmas that come with it. Um, and that you must be very careful and, and understand that um, as much as in European culture, in the African culture or Asian culture, queers has, have existed for a long time. 
and um, actually these countries are alleged to be homophobic not because of um, their political way of being but because once they were colonized um, all of their um, history on sexuality and gender etc kind of erased and the European heteronormative standard got set up on it so it's really complicated um, so I would say definitely education and religion plays a role but for me like education and information uh, is way more important and concerns um, all the neighborhoods, all of the people living in Belgium. I think I think it's interesting you brought up uh, history in, in a way because history is something that that we cannot disregard when we speak about all of this. And it is true that it was the Europeans that brought, for example, or not even Europeans, more like the uh, the Francophone Europe, let's say, more into mm-hmm. Africa when it comes to the Napoleonic Code, uh, and that and that was where in in legal standards. Um, homosexuality was banned or was criminalized in in lots of in lots of countries so so there is an historic context to that now uh now we live in the present and we see this uh these historic residues let's say that that that, that keep in in some communities whether they're whether if, if if you want white communities or even colored communities coming from abroad and i think you're completely right when you say we don't solve one issue by creating another Right. So we, we, we don't solve the issue with with uh, with, let's say, spreading acceptance towards the, the LGBTQI plus community by spreading hate towards another one. And I think that's a very big issue with this specific topic is because people just find it so easy to say, oh, it's not my fault. It's the fault of that dude there. I have nothing to do with it. Just say it's his fault. <laughs> and then it just becomes a, a basically a, a, yeah. a ping pong game of of who can attack the most um a minority let's say and and just put the all the blame on them mm. and i think one yes. of the uh, one of them one of the things that may explain the recent uh, insurgence of hate crimes with the death of uh, of david polfit is also uh, the lack of representation and visibility uh, in the media and in everything that surrounds us and this lack of representation visibility cannot be solely traced back to let's say racial uh, communities but it's a product of like wider society of our economic structure. So um, I think like representation in the media, in the political spheres, it starts to to come now, but it's very, very, very important. If we never see um, queer people uh, in in television, in the journal, in uh, the political spheres, especially, um, I don't know, queer people in the situation of handicap or queer people, who uh, are racialized, of course, uh, wider society cannot imagine these people existing in the way they are existing. So I think like the media and um, everything we consume in television uh, or journals uh, really play a a very important role that unfortunately they do not always um, fulfill, yeah. Yeah, so you're speaking more about spreading awareness, let's say, so people are aware that people like this exist and they're just like you, they're just like me, they're just like the, the other person across the street. I think now, I think, uh, is it in Belgium? Correct me if I'm wrong, you probably know this better than I do. Uh, there's now a transgender minister. Yes, yes. and there was interesting the uh, the comments you saw on Facebook, like mm-hmm. it was so hyperbolic, let's say in some ways, because I was trying to see, okay, okay, we have, I mean, and then they were like, so so many debates within the debate saying oh this is good or this is not good people saying oh, honestly i don't care as long as they do their their job right but i think this yeah. was a good step into saying okay transgender people can't do the same job as another person because it's just the same person it's just yeah. their their gender identity that changes let's say uh from the biological or the way they were born and there's not much to say about it and i do think maybe this hyperbolization of 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 an issue that in theory, in the sense that gender is not that big an issue, just let people be however they want to be. But people really do want to make this like the um, the story of the century, or or yes. just making Definitely. it so big. On the one hand, it's great news, and um, of course, people uh, are surprised because indeed um, there was never an openly transgender uh, politician as far as in the top as it is today. And at the same time, we want to be like, okay, this should be normal. Uh, there should not be a whole discussion and for two weeks all the journals filled with these news. I think it's the same as, um, I don't know, for the first female presidents or uh, vice presidents or for the black first black presidents. So 
these are all things that should be normal, but unfortunately they aren't. And so they create um, uh, this huge debate, but you touched up on something I also wanted uh, to talk about um, on why today we have like this reinsurgence of hate crimes. Um, so I don't think that there are more hate crimes uh, than there were a few years ago in Belgium. Um, but I do think that there's more awareness, more activism, uh, and that if it starts to be recognized, let's say, by also parts of society who do not feel concerned by this topic. And I think social media plays a very, very important role um, in enabling like youth hate crimes or generally homophobia and transphobia. So as you said, uh, in these kind of articles, you can find very nice comments, but you can also find a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of homo and transphobic comments. As soon as somebody uh, like a journal uh, will post something on a queer topic, you will always have a lot of people who will comment really nasty um, and violent things. And this is in a country in which we are supposed to not be homo or transphobic. So I think social media, of course, it's like really extreme. People feel anonymous, people feel protected and uh, may say things that they won't say in real life but still it's really a good mirror of what really is going on in society and how many people uh, might think about these topics. Yeah, yeah, I think that's in, in, into the issue of social media is even more complicated into the, into the overall conversation because social media and the internet is just like a lawless ground. It's somewhere, it's just like the jungle, nobody feels uh, any accountability for anything they say or anything they do, which I don't think that directly translates to what's happening in reality. Uh, the issue with this is that social media actually does sometimes show the way people actually think uh, beneath how they act. So that maybe is also an issue of the way people think, and that's why we can take social media as an example. On the okay, these are the these are the thoughts that some people are having, and and coming back to this because this is the the main topic I wanted to bring. Also, well, one of the main the reason why I wanted to do this episode, it was following now uh, well the murder or, or the killing of a young gay man here in Belgium, and apparently I'm not sure if my if my numbers are wrong or the information I got, but it was the first, let's say, sexually motivated murder since 2012. So there has been, um, in, compared, in comparison to the countries, I mean, you've seen, I've seen this, that's being positive, that, is, that isn't that bad, right? So, 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 so my idea is, what do you think happened now? How come now maybe, is it, is it let's say, the, the COVID pandemic has, gone, has turned people mad in a bit, they've tried to put the blame on anyone? Is it... Um, just the same people that were always there and then it was maybe just the situation, the time and the place, uh, just pure luck. Uh, how, how do you explain this, this kind of crime that is still happening today in 2021? And the last one was nine years ago. Um, so yeah, your numbers are definitely right. So the first, uh, let's say the first recorded crime or recognized as such a hate crime was in 2012 with Isan Jaffi, who was also uh, a young Moroccan man who got killed, captured, tortured, and killed by four people. And I think, of course, before 2012, there were other homophobic and transphobic crimes. It's just that they weren't treated and weren't yeah. recognized as such. Mm -hmm. um, and now after eight years, there's another one. Um, so, yeah, I would say that these are the most tragic and violent events that happen. And that yes, happen exactly. Uh, again, in the in the in the public sphere, and make people discuss it, but it's really just um, the top of the top of the iceberg. So, like violent homophobic and transphobic attacks happen every day, and um, it's just a matter of time uh, that something goes wrong, and that um, with premeditation or not, uh, these like these violence escalate at a point where people uh, where people really do die. And um, I think most, I know that most of the hate crimes or homo, homo and transphobic discriminations and aggressions um, are not um, reported. So they are just um, going under the carpet. And um, this is why now it seems such a surprise because we haven't heard about these kind of things uh, for eight years, but uh, they are happening. It's just that we are not really aware of it, or the people who are victims of it um, are not uh, are not sharing it. But I think, as I said before, I think like there's a big lack of uh, of like representation and visibility. And then I also touched a bit about upon the subject of uh, of sexism, 
for me, um, both are really linked. Uh, sexism, sexism enables really uh, homo and transphobia because finally, um, the fear of, uh, for example, the gay men, of the effeminate men, uh, or of um, a transgender woman is really rooted into, into sexism. It is in, in the belief of, okay, we have two genders, we have men and we have women. Men are supposed to be men, women are supposed to be women, and both are supposed to get together, uh, have sex, make babies, and everything which is outside of this is unnatural and unnormal. And so be it gender expression, gender identity, sexual orientation, everything that diverges from this norm, from heteronormativity, is uh, is a threat to this this um, this system. So um, all of the homo and transphobes are sexist, and many people who are sexist may also be homo and transphobic. Uh, so both are really linked. And if we don't uh, have this discussion about sexism too, um, like homo and transphobia will 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 not disappear. And then I think lastly, it's also yeah, just um, a widespread homo and transphobia that we are not fully realizing. And that is not always uh, these kind of violent aggression where somebody dies. Uh, most of the times it's really way more subtle. It's, I don't know, parents who have nothing against gay people, who say gay people can marry themselves, but who are a bit uncomfortable seeing two men holding hands in public, or who would say, okay, they can be gay, but not my son. So these are like very recurrent things. Um, and these people don't consider themselves homophobic. Um, they think that they are open, but at the end of the day, they are they are not because they would not accept this for, for their for their children, or they are not giving um like using the same standards of what is public defect affection and what can people show for queer people and for heterosexual people. Um and for example, the killing of David. So the three youngsters who uh, who robbed him and killed him. Um, so now police is uh, kind of um, investigating, and they found out that these youngsters uh, were part of, let's say, a group or a gang of uh, pedo hunters. So um, people who track pedophiles um, or who claim to track pedophiles, but in basically just want to rob these people. What happened also with David? And um, yeah, these are young men who are using, let's say, this, uh, this excuse of pedophilia to, to, to rob people. And they could have used any other excuse or choose any other target group if they choose uh, this excuse of we are hunting pedophiles and we are robbing gay men. It's because in their head, being gay means being a pedophile or uh, being at risk of being a pedophile. So this is like huge misconception, a huge cliche that, uh, I don't know, they use or that they really believe and um, which ends in in, um, in these kind of, uh, of crimes, yeah. I think that was a narrative that was inserted in um, end of the 20th century, if I'm not mistaken, maybe in the 70s, 60s, something like that, that, the, that gay people were paedophiles. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that maybe for some people that, um it's still a belief it's still a, a really hardcore belief and i think that's a big issue because again we're coming back to the generalization of of um of what is homosexuality and that homosexuals are pedophiles because then why would they be interested in men and lots of different issues i like the fact that you brought up that this hate crime is indeed the extreme on where it can go but in between you have all these different things that are happening throughout the day um i mean it's more common for example beat-ups um, uh, hitting someone in the street or following them or making them uncomfortable or calling them names and um, when we speak about the legal term crime maybe that that can be up to debate but it's still some it's still attack on the LGBTQI plus community it's still some sort of a some sort of hate crime in a sense um, so how do you deem the importance let's say uh, would you be more to saying, okay, for example, some people would say, okay, that's fine. I mean, everyone gets comments in the street and then other people would mm -hmm. say, but we need to stop when people get killed because that's not good uh, mm -hmm. in either case. Um, and I really have a hard time visualizing right now what would be the best approach onto, onto tackling both because you have one extreme, which, uh, mm -hmm. which is indeed the killing of, of innocent people. 
And then you have the other extreme where we get more into hate speech, right? And this mm-hmm. is a bit, and, and, and in the in-between, it can be like the evolution from hate speech towards hate crime when it comes to calling mm-hmm. a person a name, making them uncomfortable, uh, hitting them up to the end to killing them. Uh, that, that's the escalation. Um, how do you see this correlation between hate speech and hate crime in a way? Um, so I think um, hate speech enables the hate crime. So without uh, hate speech, there would be no hate crime. There is um, not just a person getting up in the morning and deciding like this, okay, today I'm going to stab a, a gay person or what happened in the US today, I'm going to shoot um, Asian uh, persons with Asian descent uh, and kill um, mainly Asian, Asian women. So there's always uh, a narrative behind that justifies these kind of crimes, except if the person really is uh, completely mentally deranged. Um, so, and this narrative, um, this narrative is is based on hate speech, be it being part of uh, an internet group um, where you rant about uh, foreigners and gay people, for example, or feminists or um, against the Asian people. It always comes from somewhere. And the hate speech must not necessarily be expressed by the person uh, in itself. It can simply be uh, being surrounded by people who, who foster this narrative and consuming it uh, through videos, through articles, um, and kind of interiorizing it um, to justify uh, to justify your hate. And yeah, so both are both are linked. And without hate speech, there would be no hate crime. And the hate speech it, in itself uh, comes from like the misconceptions and the, the lack of information and education on these topics. Uh, so not understanding what does it mean uh, to be a queer person, um, why, what does it, what is transgender, what are transgender identities, um, and not to feel threatened by it. Because at the end of the day, these people who are homophobes or transphobes or who do homophobic hate speech or hate crimes, um, either they feel threatened, uh, they feel threatened in their system of beliefs, in their values, they feel attacked, um, they want to defend themselves from an invisible threat, from a non-existent threat, um, or they are part of an ideology, um, or they want to, um, yeah, they feel threatened, they feel, um, they, feel uh, they want to defend themselves. So it all, it all stems from like a lack of understanding and a lack of uh, information on these topics, um, which really messes everything up. So I think the key is really like the education. It starts there because at the end of the day, of course, what is important is also to punish the authors of like hate crime or hate speech, to have laws that uh, are efficient, uh, to have centers where people are comfortable enough to come and complain and that things are like happening on a legal, um, on a legal point of view. But this is just when, it, when the action has already happened. This is like the, the sanctioning part. Um, but in order for us, for the situation to get better, uh, it's not enough to just work on this part. We need to talk, to work, to work on the uh, preventive part to make sure that these things don't even happen. Um, and this is in the education. I mean, it starts in kindergarten, in school, with the training of police officers, with the training of um, the person, the social workers who work in refugee centers. Um, it starts, I also think maybe with quotas as we do it with um, um, female quotas in politics, in society, uh, like in um, indus- industry and stuff. So yeah, and also with money, of course, like funding um, funding the organizations, the refugees for queer people, the centers uh, against discrimination, uh, all of these civil, organizations that try to act on the field uh, against hate, hate crime and hate speech. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, we can get now a bit because we have around 15 minutes left. So we can get around the end of what can people do. And I think this is the most important part because then right now we laid out the issues, the consequences of those issues. But then of course we need to find solutions to those problems. We can't just, okay, it's always good to spread awareness and speak about the problems, but most importantly to see how we can solve these problems but but first of all i would like to give a bit more 
bit more in-depth definition maybe or how would you define a hate crime not necessarily when you look in the dictionary but how would you define it is it just a comment based on hate speech or is it really goes up to the killing what's your definition of that so a hate crime does not need to come up until until the killing so um I don't really know, like the legal category of the crime and offense or crime. Not legally, always... not legally specifically. No. Like your definition, how would you define but, it? Um, yeah, it's a crime. It's a it's an attack based on a person where the intent is really to create a prejudice against this person, and the choice of the person is because this person belongs or seems to belong to a certain group, so uh, a certain social group. So be it a certain ethnicity, um, be it the fact to be a part of a uh, the people with disabilities, be it um, to talk a certain language, to have a certain religion, or of course, to have a certain sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression. And the interesting thing is, and I, I just Googled that before. So in Belgium, we have uh, this law since 2003 that um, adds more penalty to hate crimes. So to all of the crimes that create prejudice against a person and that are motivated because this person belongs to a certain social group. So this law exists since 2003. So we see, okay, legally the law is uh, it's really um, uh, modern and et cetera, but the category of gender and uh, gender expression, gender identity was only added in 2013. Uh, yeah, 2013. So um, there was kind of a, a gap between first, okay, we will we will include in what is a hate crime, race, ethnicity, um, disability, language, sexual orientation, but it also took some time for the legislator and so for wider for for society to understand. Okay, there is not just sexual orientation; there are also transgender people, or they are or there are people who um, dress differently from what their their gender or the gender imposed upon them um, expect, and so. Yeah, I would say this is a hate crime. And then consequences of the hate crime make, make it a hate crime. So not only, of course, the victim is traumatized, uh, in distress psychologically and or physically, but also like the consequences on the community, the social group to which this person belongs and like the wider uh, public. So like the community, let's say uh, a, a queer person was, uh, was uh, attacked, uh, the wider LGBTQ community, uh, and this was has been measured like psychologically, will be uh, more prone to depression, to anxiety, and just to a climate of terror because they feel okay, there is a threat. We are being targeted. Um, we don't feel comfortable, for example, holding hands in public space, using dating apps like Grinder, meeting um, people you don't know yet, and in wider society, a hate crime. Um, creates divisions and uh, factions. So you will have the community, which has been attacked, and then you will have the perpetrators, and then you will have, let's say, the rest of society. And it kind of divides the group that is a victim of the hate crime from the rest of society by because it's like such a specific target. So maybe the rest of society doesn't really feel concerned because let's say they are not gay or they are not black or they don't have a disability. Um, and there's also like the danger of the hate crime, not only that it hurts, of course, the victim, but it really um, excludes the group which is targeted from, from the rest of society. And it destabilizes like the, the integration, like the inclusiveness of, of wider society. Yeah, it, it, it is that. It's just basically the, the continuous persecution of these minorities that does give them like a, a state of fear to these people. Like if they see someone in their town that has been attacked for that and they are like them, of course, you're going to be scared because they say, OK, I could be an ex one or that could have been that could have been me. I could have been at the same bar. I could have been on that same street. That person could have been me. And then it is true that that creates a, a whole situation of distress uh, for the person. And that, mm. yeah, and anyways, I'm going to try and be <laughs> I mean, it's just it's just a, such a complicated situation because it is true that. If you see people like you that are being chased around, it's only but normal to you around, be scared to even step out of your house or walk around or or be in those same areas where your peer was, because in mm -hmm. the end, you are under that same threat of being attacked or being called names or in the worst cases, being killed. Um, 
I want to see now with you, because now you, you, you brought the third party into the society. We, we saw the perpetrators, you saw the victims, and then you saw the, the external society, let's say, that doesn't really feel concerned with, with one or the other. Um, what do you think, let's say, an, an individual can do if they, if they see a hate crime, if they see, if they experience it, or they, or they hear about it? What do you think is the best approach for, for a person, just one that doesn't feel identified with one or the other? Um, so I think uh, when a hate crime or hate speech happens in public space and you are um, you are witness to it, um, the most important thing is to react, but uh, to react while keeping yourself safe also, because we have seen it, people have also been attacked while they were trying to help other people. That happened here the other week, I think. That happened here the other week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, the hairdresser who put on who put on like a, a queer flag and um, his window got smashed. No, 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 that wasn't it. It was actually a man that was going to defend the woman that was being attacked by 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 four men, and then yeah. the woman got away, but the guy got stabbed by these four men. And yeah, of course, I'm I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because mm -hmm. that's also people are scared of that. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's really so. That's that's the question of civil of civil of civil uh, bravery. And uh, and there's always a risk of uh, of yourself getting getting hurt. I think the most important thing is to create like solidarity and awareness in these kind of situations. To feel to to interpel the other persons around you. Hey, what's happening here is not normal. Um, hold hold this man. Call the call uh, security. Um, let's try and include this person which is being attacked. I think the worst thing to do is to ignore it or to do like okay, I'm not. I'm not part of it, it's not my problem. Um, sometimes it can also be, um, for example, playing like a, a role. So this happens uh, more in sex situations when you see, for example, a couple, couple disputing, um, the man getting really violent. Um, you can, for example, go up to the, 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 the woman uh, and do as if you were friends and ask her uh, if uh, she, she wants to go this way and then just, if the person agrees, of course, go with the person this way and try to isolate her from, from the perpetrator. So there are different strategies, and I think you can and look everything up. Uh, I think there are great YouTube videos on like how to try to de-escalate situations um, while keeping yourself, yourself so uh, physically uh, aware. But I think, yeah, the most important thing is to react and to get help if you are not feeling like, okay, you can, you can handle this situation by yourself. And then I think... Um, outside of the situation where it, it does happen, it's really to, 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 to talk about these issues and to connect yourself with the community which is under attack. So just because you're queer doesn't mean that uh, you're, you're not touched by these subjects. I mean, this is an attack on one person, it's an attack on, on everybody. So the first thing is to get educated on these subjects, to understand what is happening, and then by yourself, try to change mentalities because we all have friends, we all have family members who are maybe racist, maybe homophobic. Um, that's unfortunately, it is uh, what it is. And I think of course it's great to talk like uh, to the wider public, but the real work starts in your, in your intimate uh, circles because this is the hardest. But uh, if everybody can have discussions, uh, more discussions with their family, with their parents, with their grandparents or aunties or brothers and sisters and friends. Um, this would already like help so, so, so much. So yeah, informing yourself and then educating at your, at your, um, at your level. And of course, listening to the people's experiences. I think that's also very important. Um, it's always the people who experience these discriminations who know best what's best for them, um, what strategies to use. And we should really listen to their, to their expertise and their experience and um, just, be, just be a good ally to, to their causes. Yeah, I mean, the change in education starts in the private sphere. So to try and bring mm -hmm. up more of the topic, yeah. try and speak about it more, try and, and uh, spread a bit more understanding, awareness on, on the issue. Um, the solution you brought back before, like what to do when you see like some sort of harassment in the street is very interesting because um, for me, the one that has worked best, let's say, is the friend one. Mm -hmm. So this is funny because there was this uh, uh, there was this girl that was here with her friend 
and basically we met her it was around three years ago I actually had her on on on, on a podcast uh, last year I invited her to a podcast and she uh, she's from the USA and basically what happened I was in the bar with my two friends and then she was being harassed by three four guys with her friend and then they, they I mean they, they weren't lesbian but they were acting lesbian so that people don't mm-hmm. go to, I mean is that was also that kind of a of a defense mechanism to say no we are together don't mm-hmm. bother us but the guys just mm-hmm. kept and then we saw that and then we were like uh, and then we just had a random name basically and say hey how are you and then we just mm-hmm. left space on the, on the on the on the table and that really worked and i think especially in public spaces that that that's maybe the the best solution to have is that if the person knows what what you are doing then the, the person mm-hmm. knows it so just shout out a random name say how are mm-hmm. you it's been a long time or uh, mm-hmm. whatever and i do think that's the most maybe safest way of helping someone that is in that situation and and, and i'm saying it by personal experience that that has worked um, yeah. we're not asking people to, to jump on the gun directly because mm-hmm. of course you need to assess the situation and, and the kinds of danger you can put yourself into also but just trying to see the best situation to get and I really do think that's the thing that has worked best uh, yeah, in no, a way right it's like a great and a safe uh, approach and also uh, you have the time to like if the person uh, needs your help like they can react they can reach out they can uh, say hi back and they can join you um, so yeah that's a great uh, yeah exactly it's what happened it's really what happened and and they saw what we were doing and then they said oh how are you guys and they just said random names and they just came on the table and then they waited for 10 minutes and then they left basically and that is something that in a bar of course it's a more in a bar or in school for example or wherever in a more um in a more public space where lots of people are there it is safer of course because it's not the same as in an alley as in an alley i think if it comes down in the middle of the night in an alley best choice you can do is just call the police directly and mm. and I think now we're going to speak about that uh before we finish in uh very very, very shortly do, do you think the police take seriously these allegations or or these attacks or when they are reported um I think that's a difficult question so there are great police officers there are also for example in Brussels the rainbow uh, cops who are uh, an association of LGBTQI police officers they are specific instruments that police created um to um to um accompany the victims of uh, like home and transphobic crimes so this is like on the one side but then on the other side since home and transphobia and sexism are systemic and widespread in all of society they are also widespread in in police and it would be really naive to to think that um just because they are police officers and they are told to not be home and transphobic uh, they are not home and transphobic so um, there are many cases where uh, police uh, was asked to intervene, for example, in homo and transphobic uh, situations and where uh, the situation was not taken seriously. I think that's the first, uh, first problem um, or uh, that the police officers were just disinterested uh, in it. Um, and this, of course, uh, and then also when victims of homo and transphobia uh, went to the police, that they were confronted also like with disinterest or yeah it's not serious in the offense or even like homo homo and transphobia in itself by some police officers and so of course like these events uh, really um diminuate the trust of the community in uh, in the police even though they are tools and there may be some lgbtqi friendly police officers so in reality, uh, there are not many uh, crimes or discriminations and offenses who are getting reported to because the community doesn't feel safe, doesn't trust the police and uh, prefers to, to not go there. So this is like one of the main reasons why the numbers, the official numbers don't correspond at all to reality. And so there's also civil society, which tries to kind of like, yeah, um, make up for this gap and propose, uh, for example, tools as the Rainbow House where you can come and report uh, homo and transphobic crimes parallel to the police to just have like a parallel statistic. But it also doesn't work so well because uh, these kind of tools really need to be visibilized. Um, there needs to be like social system, psychological service, and it's just, yeah, there's just a lack of tools, I would say, and funds to really make, make it efficient. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I think also that police uh, 
needs to be educated and informed more, that there needs to be also harder sanctions for police officers who are homo-transphobic or who do not um, react appropriately and kind of uh, are disinterested or negate like the gravity of, uh, of the offense. Um, and yeah, this also starts with education and formation trainings, um, obligatory mandatory trainings, what is LGBT, what are LGBTQI people, how can you host them properly, how to react, how to accompany them, what to do with internal situations. Um, so this is also like a big, a big, um, how do you say? A big um Chantier. oh yeah okay so a bigger um okay how would you call this uh, a bigger construction site let's say so a bigger yeah. a, a longer term project like how to do it but this is more like i mean there are a lot of long-term projects that still need to be uh, more assessed not just in the police force but in society in schooling for example which we didn't really cover but that's also a big issue in families in culture mm -hmm. there are so many different spaces but right now we need to see a bit what can we do in the short term, let's say, or bit by bit to start building up to this, to this end game where we want to do mm -hmm. at the space where no more hate crime is committed, where no one based yeah. on their sexuality or sexual expression or sexual orientation um, mm -hmm. is attacked, let's say, just by being themselves, basically. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think, uh, to, to uh, really uh, shorten up here at the end, um, the LGBTQI plus community is doing apart from these spaces? Do you think that's the only thing they're doing or can they do a bit more uh, in opening maybe more spaces, more organizations, uh, psychological, let's say, help towards people? What are the answers to this? Um, I think there are many great initiatives in Brussels and in Belgium, uh, be it like psychological support, um, victims groups, um, help for parents of LGBTQI persons, um, events of course but i think yeah it always comes back to um a lack of of inclusion of these topics into wider society and then just a lack of funding and support um so of course it's great to have these spaces and it's really important uh, to have them uh, especially like places who try to be more safer than uh, most of the spaces but at the end of the day uh, we still have to live together all of us which is good, but which is also risky. So at the end of the day, the focus should really be on how to how to integrate and how to not integrate, uh, let's say, the LGBTQI community into the normal society, but how to make the rest of society aware of these topics so that the LGBTQI community doesn't feel excluded from the beginning. Um, so there are many things done by the LGBTQ community for the LGBTQI plus community, but there could really be done way, way more uh, for like the non-LGBTQI people so that they are aware of what's going on, who are these people, what are they doing, and then that they can support even more the LGBTQI community with funds, with um, like material help, becoming a volunteer, um, sharing uh, information, sharing news. Um, so I have the impression like it's really kind of hermetic and separated and um, yeah. Like this wall should be teared down and there should be way more interaction and exchange. So, yeah, so it's basically a bit more wider society in a way that does need to do a bit more of effort because they're not doing enough. The LGBTQI plus community generally is doing quite a bit because, of course, they are directly concerned. What we need a bit more is understanding with the other spheres in society where they need to start giving more from their side, let's say, pushing a bit more. And that third party we spoke about before, not the perpetrators, not the victims, but that third party that needs to move a little bit more into that same direction. Um, I mean, I think we spoke about a lot of different things. I mean, this conversation can go on for hours, days even, uh, especially when we can cover education, which that was mainly one of the main issues. Uh, but I'd like to ask you first, what are, because we are closing now, what, what, what would be your closing words? What would be, for example, your advice, either young, a queer person, a person that feels identifies, identified with the LGBTQI plus community, uh, as just a heterosexual person that doesn't feel uh, identified with this, uh, what, what would you tell them for these kind of situations, both for a queer person and both for a heterosexual person? So, yeah, I would say to the queer persons and to the non-queer persons to not be afraid of their identity, to um, understand and know that there are many, many more people, that there is nothing unnormal and unnatural, and that they 
should uh, not be afraid of showing who they are and living living their living their identity and reaching out if they need help because we are here we are queer we will help each other we will support each other and i think for the non queer persons it's also to not be afraid of the unknown uh, simply um there is the internet, which is a great source of information. Um, you just need to look, you just need to ask uh, the right questions with respect, of course. Um, and um, I mean, we are all humans at the end of the day. Uh, nobody will bite you um, as a heterosexual person for, for being heterosexual or for not knowing all the answers. That's okay. Um, just don't be afraid of, of us and be open to 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 get educated to get uh to get informed and willing to learn and uh, and to grow yeah yeah i mean like i said the information is always there you just need to know where to look and where and when mm -hmm. to look which is the internet basically and anyway uh, on those closing words i would like to thank you a lot bc again for for joining uh, again i miss my civico this was youth on air podcast and we're going to see now for the thank you very much for listening for the whole hate crime uh, speech and hate speech uh podcast because I think it was a very very interesting topic indeed again thank you very much BC would you like to say goodbye so to much. the listeners yes thank you so much for having me uh, it was super great to talk about all of these things and yeah don't hesitate to follow everybody on social media and to to look up all the things we said there's so much information and yeah thanks again for having we'll be me. sharing all that thank you very much for joining BC